Thanks very much for joining us for the American Ambulance Association's Ambulance Fleet Maintenance Tips for Weathering the Chassis and Chip Shortages webinar. Today's session is being recorded as well as live streamed to Facebook. Please check your member digest tomorrow morning for a copy of the slides as well as the recorded session. To ask questions on Facebook, please use the comment feature in the Facebook platform. To ask questions on the Zoom platform, please use the Q&A function located next to your participant panel or the actual regular chat function. Q&A is represented by the double dialog box. With that housekeeping aside, I'm, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Mark Van Arnhem, Administrator of the CAS Ground Vehicle Standard. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, as uh, Amanda mentioned, I am the administrator of the Ground Vehicle Standard for the Commission on Accreditation of Ambulance Services. In addition to that, I do serve as the liaison between the ambulance manufacturers and the American Ambulance Association. Here today, we want to talk about an issue relative to ambulance manufacturing that I think is of interest to everybody, and it's a very important topic that we discuss today. I wanna give you a little uh, explanation first, a little background on the ambulance product before we get into the conversation. And as everyone knows, uh, the ambulance is a complex uh, kind of product to manufacture. It's actually a two-stage vehicle where you have an OEM chassis built by one of the chassis manufacturers, be it Ford, General Motors, Sprinter, et cetera, et cetera. And then converted by an ambulance builder, which we call an FSAM or final stage ambulance manufacturer. So in order to build these ambulances, and we're all very familiar with the process and, and, and how it works, um, you need to have, have the chassis. That's the fundamental building block and the platform for the actual ambulance itself. And that is the issue that triggers uh, the problem today. And we're gonna talk about that, where the, where the situation is relative to the ambulance chassis and how that affects you. In addition, we wanna talk a, a little bit about the ambulance conversion itself because it is relevant uh, to what's going on uh, with this discussion and in today's uh, political and economical uh, situation. So the ambulance conversion, once you do have the chassis, the ambulance conversion is also a complex piece. And I wanna make that part of the conversation today. So the ambulance builder, and, and there are a lot of ambulance builders throughout North America, uh, the average ambulance builder will have about 150 different vendors that he buys parts from in addition to the chassis itself and will inventory about 3,000 different parts to build that vehicle. And I will tell you uh, that on custom vehicles and for special order, uh, that number can increase two or three times of the different kinds of parts and things of that nature that are needed to build that ambulance. In addition, there's a lot of raw materials, components, and different kinds of systems that all are part of the ambulance uh, product. And, and, and that's important, and, I, and I'll explain further in a minute why that is important, uh, because it is part of the discussion here. So once you have the chassis, once you have all those parts and you can start to build an ambulance, there's a throughput cycle time to build these ambulances. So the, the cycle time of a type two ambulance might be two months on, a, on, a, on an average. So from the time that the chassis is received, that ambulance or FSEM, can build that type two ambulance and ship it to a customer in, in approximately two, uh, two months or so. On the modular side, it's a much more complex product, much more complex uh, pro project. And that can be a six, eight, 10, 12 month process. So keep in mind when we have the discussion uh, here today that when we do talk about chassis are stopped and chassis are coming, uh, hopefully so, and you'll hear about that a little bit more about where we are today, you know that the lead time, production time for those products uh, is two to eight to 10, 12 months past the time the chassis will arrive. And I think that is very important for the discussion for your planning in, hey, my ambulance didn't get here. It was scheduled for X. It's not gonna come until two X or three X. And why is that and, and what is happening? So we'll, we'll have those, uh, those conversations. The problem that we have right now today is that interruptions in the complex supply chain of ambulances cause delays in production and delivery of those vehicles. And that's what we want to, to talk to you about. Now we saw this during 2020 
in 2020, ambulance chassis uh, specifically were slowed down and in many cases uh, stopped, production stopped because of COVID related shutdowns of the plants. Uh, Ford, GM, Sprinter, everyone had plants that shut down uh, due to COVID in their plants as, as many of you saw in a, in a wide variety of, uh, of, of other businesses. Uh, so we did have a, a supply problem with those, those chassis. Uh, I'm pleased to say that the, uh, the problem was is not as large as it could have been. And uh, we actually got through that uh, without too much trouble. Please know that during this whole process, we, we had a function of process between the American Ambulance Association and the ambulance builders and the, and, and the federal and state governments to report this and keep this on the radar. You'll hear a little bit more about that a little bit later from Maria, uh, but that is a process that it has gone on all through last year and it is going on now as well. Uh, so what is happening right now? Here we are in 2021. If 2020 was the year of the pandemic, uh, I would say 2021 is the year of shortages. We are seeing tremendous shortages, not just chassis, but we're causing delays in chassis production and all different kinds of components. I know you're seeing it in your businesses. You're seeing it uh, with ambulance parts. You're seeing it with drugs and medication. You're seeing it with equipment. You're seeing it with other kinds of things. But I wanna make the point here, it is not just the chassis we're talking about, but we also have a perfect storm relative to those materials required for conversion of the ambulance. We have a global wire shortage, a shortage of copper, a shortage of the wire jackets that are, that are, that are generated through plastics that are made in plants in, in Texas that suffered during the freeze. We have a worldwide plywood shortage and a wood shortage. We have plastic and polycarbonate shortage. There's an aluminum shortage. I think if you type just about anything in Google these days and put shortage behind it, you're gonna get a story as to why this is a short commodity. So that is also affecting the ambulance piece. So please, please know that this is not just a chassis shortage that's causing an ambulance problem, but rather a commodity shortage. What's causing that? Well, you hear it every day on the news, you know it's caused by labor shortages, shortage of materials, weather delays, shipping delays, uh, geopolitical issues causing supplier uh, failures, uh, a wide variety of things. So it is not uh, happy days are here again because chassis start to flow, but this is a process that will go on for quite some period of time into 2022, likely to the end of this year. So first we do wanna talk about primarily the chassis piece. You know that the chassis are delayed uh, significantly by a, a microchip shortage. We won't go into the deal, details of the microchip shortage. You can read that uh, on your own time, but I think you really want to know why and how is that affecting the production of chassis for ambulances. So with us today is uh, Mark McEver. Uh, Mark is the dealer principal of Olathe Ford and the owner of Olathe Fleet. Mark is the largest commercial Ford dealer in the country, and it's the supplier of the majority of ambulance uh, chassis here in the United States to the ambulance builders. So Mark is with us today and Mark has the latest, greatest information. Uh, this is a moving target and it has changing on a daily basis. And Mark will tell us where we are today. And uh, then we'll talk a little bit further about, about how this affects the industry production. Mark. All right, thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate your introduction there. Uh, we're gonna go through Mercedes, Ford and GM. And, uh, and I thought I'd just kind of start off with Mercedes. Uh, uh, to start us off here. And so in, in two, Mercedes is still shipping and it kind of gets confusing here. So stay with me. They're still shipping 2020 model vehicles that they built prior to 2021. So they stopped building in January, basically January 1 of 2021 on 20 model vehicles. And then they uh, stockpiled those vehicles to, to get us through their normal emissions problems of getting that approved for the first part of 2021. So they're still shipping those out. So there's no build problem there. What's happened now is there's actually a recall or a, actually a couple recalls on Mercedes that has actually happened while these vehicles are still at the, the PC, uh, the, the plant waiting to get shipped. And that's causing some of the delay on the vehicles that are there right now. On the chip side, they're actually producing 21s uh, and what they're doing to, to help this is to limit the amount of options. So it, it, some vehicles 
may take anywhere from 25 to 40 chips. And depending on the options of that vehicle, you can eliminate some of those options to reduce the amount of chips per vehicle. So Mercedes has been pretty good at that, honestly, and has lost some production, but not as much as Ford and General Motors on, on, that, on the chip problem. So they have reduced some of the options. You can't order vehicles with uh, seven inch screens, for instance, which most of the ambulance guys don't use anyway. So it really hadn't hurt this industry, but they've limited some options. Uh, Ford is even limited on an expedition, for instance, a, a uh, airbag in the back seat that they put on some vehicles that saved like three chips. So they're limiting options on a lot of different manufacturers to, to keep production rolling and, and things moving. Currently, we have a, uh, on the Mercedes side, we do have a couple recalls, like I talked about, that is slowing down shipment of the, of the current vehicles that are already built and setting there. And uh, they're working through that, but it looks like we're gonna be into August before we really get through all that and get them back shipping at a normal rate. Uh, 2021s will we'll go into, then start shipping after that. And again, they were still waiting on an, an emissions approval which is kind of a common problem for Mercedes. They fight this every year. We still do not have a full emissions approval from the government, United States government on 2021s. So they're building those and stockpiling those as well until they get this emissions approval uh, for the 21 models. General Motors is a, kind of a whole different case. They actually shut down or stopped taking orders in January for 2021 models. So they were they had demand way over what they could produce early on before the chip problem really got serious in, in February and March again. So um, they've been having kind of a whole nother problem of, of a lack of production to meet their demand. And, uh, uh, they're in, and so they shut the plants down because of the chip in, uh, in April, I believe it was April 19th, and the plant is still not running yet. So you won't see that open up until next month, I believe. And uh, so they have a major, major shortage on, on their hands that have not met demand for quite some time. And, and General Motors over the years has really had a, a history of production problems. Um, and that's really, I think, a lot of the reason Ford has been so successful in this vocation and a lot of others like motorhome and, and shuttle bus or school bus, because they, Ford produces regularly and, del and delivers to manufacturers where they can actually plan on running a plant using their vehicles. General Motors will go time to time where you just get nothing for months on, on time on end and can't supply these manufacturing plants to run consistently like they run theirs. So um, it looks to me like that you're gonna, that they're gonna be in, in a uh, uh, at least another nine months to a year before General Motors really gets the feet back on, under them. Um, and I am gonna mention on the ambulance manufacturers of the United States and North America, really Canada, all wrote a letter back when COVID started to, to the OEM of Ford to, to explain to them how important that, that their vehicle is to the ambulance uh, vocation. And that, that put them ahead of a lot of uh, other vocations like motorhome and, and such to get production from Ford. They wrote another letter on May 25th of this year. I actually spoke to the head of, of Ford fleet yesterday and he uh, confirmed that they, they'd gotten this letter and he confirmed both in 2020 and 21, this letter and the way Ford feels about um, the ambulance vocation, they are putting them ahead of motorhome and shuttle bus for sure. Uh, I, would, I would recommend that they do the same thing for General Motors and, and the head of fleet there, Mr. Jim Conley, to, to try to get um, some better traction with General Motors in the ambulance vocation. Um, probably Ford is the most important thing that, that you guys want to hear about. Again, like I said, without a doubt, uh, ambulance is extremely important to Ford. They understand how important their vehicle is to this vocation. They understand that they have 70, 80% of the total production of ambulances for, on Ford vehicles. In fact, uh, I shared a, a video yesterday with Mark that I've shared with him before, that, and you guys have probably seen that, where Ford actually did a commercial showing ambulance and fire trucks on that commercial uh, nationwide. 
and uh, a great spot if you haven't seen it, look it up. Um, but Ford is very committed to this. They promised me that they will try to build every vehicle that for with an ambulance package. And a lot of people don't know this, that, uh, and that's the case with all the OEMs, is you have to have an ambulance prep package on this vehicle so they can make sure they have the proper cooling, make sure they can track every vehicle that's built into an ambulance. They know which ones are ambulances. And so it's very easy for these OEMs to actually look at the universe of vehicles ordered and pick out which ones are ambulances because they have a special code. So Ford knows that. Ford's promised me and to the, to the vocation to make sure that they build a high, high percentage, maybe even as high as 100% of all the ambulances that are on order for 2020, actually 22. It's a little confusing, 21 and 22, depending on the vehicle. Um, and they, they, their plan is to build almost 100% of those, which in some of the other vocations, they're estimating more like 40 or 50% of the, of the vehicles on order will get built. So without a doubt, they, they put a lot of credence to the ambulance industry and, and I, and like you guys would all appreciate that. Um, so as far as plant shutdowns, uh, Ford shut most of the, uh, the three plants that you guys would be most interested in is the transit plant, the E-Series plant and the F Super Duty plant. All three of those are basically shut down mid-April and were shut down for the most part for two months. So Ford lost, you know, uh, 20, almost 20 percent of, of their total production of those vehicles for, for the year. Uh, they, in the last just few weeks, they've actually started up. They're, they're now running. Um, they can't guarantee that they're going to be able to run um, at 100 percent rate forever. There may be some weekly shutdowns. There may be some, uh, some shift shutdowns where they normally run two shifts or three shifts. They may run one or two instead of three. Uh, so there'll be ways that they work with to try to you know, keep the plants running as much as they possibly can. And all that, by the way, has to be worked through the union, as you can imagine. Um, like I said, they, in some of the cases, they will be losing anywhere from 40 to 50% of the production uh, in certain plants, depending on the shortage over the next quarter, that will reduce for the fourth quarter down to probably 15 or 20 percent, maybe down to five or 10 percent in the first quarter of 2022. And then they expect to be fully operational in second quarter 2022. Um, so and, that, and that's pretty much a blanket statement for all three of those plants. The transit plant, which is ironically right here in Kansas City, uh, Clay Como, Missouri, is, has been the worst. Uh, this is a very, very difficult vehicle with a tremendous amount of options, 73 different body codes and body types. Uh, it's the most complicated vehicle uh, built in North America. It is, uh, they had a, and has been a true success for Ford. They have over 50% market share in the van and cutaway market for the transit. And um, they have uh, reduced uh, capacity because of that complexity. So they got about 20,000 orders that they will not be able to build this year for 2021. And those are fleet orders that will be either pushed to 2022 model year or canceled depending on what the customer wants. Uh, again, they have committed to build almost all of the ambulances for transit and E-series and F-series that have an ambulance prep package on them. Uh, I can't stress that enough. They are very committed to this, this vocation. Um, I think that kind of wraps up really the most part of, the, of, of my presentation. If you obviously have questions now or, or later, I'll be more than happy to stay on and answer. Thank you very much again for the invitation. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. So uh, let us try to give you some idea of the magnitude of what is going, going on right now. You heard, the, you heard the data from Mark, and, and I'll tell you, that uh, this, is, this is changing daily. So this is kind of a moving target that we really don't know that what they want to happen in September will happen or August and so forth. But let me give you an idea, uh, strictly non-scientific as to what uh, it looks to me, and this is just my personal uh, guess as to where these numbers are right now relative to ambulance production. So keep in mind two things. Number one, all ambulance builders source their ch chassis 
from one or multiple sources. They may have a chassis pool. They may be buying from a dealer or through a contract of some kind, a customer contract, A. And B, that once a chassis is on the ground, um, you have a two to six to eight to 12 month uh, throughput time on the backside of that without even regards to a backlog that is building up during a period of time when, when uh, we're not building anything. So keep in mind, um, this thing j just does back up. And once these chassis start to flow, uh, it doesn't mean that we have a tremendous uh, windfall overnight. But on a short-term basis, uh, I'll tell you, this, this is how it, it looks to me, just based on uh, a casual conversation uh, with some of the builders. Uh, as Mark said, the, the, the transit has been the toughest one. Type two ambulances, for those of you with type twos, I would say in Q2 and Q3, production is down. Ambulance production is down about 70 or 80% of the norm. Um, that's, that's huge. So basically van production is basically down to nothing for Q2 and Q3. Uh, if you wanna talk about Q4 deliveries, and I'm talking deliveries of completed ambulances, that depends on what the chassis do. If the chassis start to come back in August and in September, you could take delivery on ambulances in Q4, uh, again, predicated on your ambulance builder and, uh, and his backlog and his ability to build. That's on the type twos. Type threes, not quite as bad. Type threes are down Q, Q ambulance production, Q2 and Q3. I estimate 20 to 50%. So we're thinking about half of what we should have going out. Again, Q4, same situation. Uh, the production cycle on those being a bit longer. If chassis start to roll in August, September, you could see you could see completed ambulances in the fourth quarter and maybe into the first quarter of, of, of 22. Type one, um, the good news is for those of you who run type ones, uh, that uh, that is the least affected of what we've seen here. I don't exactly know why, uh, but the F trucks and have been in, in pretty decent supply and have kept a lot of people going. So in Q2 and Q3. Uh, F truck production, type one production, has only been down about 10 or 20%. Again, fourth quarter, we'll see where that goes, what happens in, uh, in the fourth quarter, uh, determines how that works on a going forward basis. Type ones are, are not too bad. Uh, long term on 2022, obviously we're gonna have to get through the backlog, uh, get the chassis flowing back at the normal rate. Uh, that is obviously not gonna happen on day one. Uh, but I think some of this goes well into the first and second quarter of uh, 2022 and maybe uh, uh, further. That is, again, just a gut feel on our behalf uh, based on what the ambulance builders can do or, or will do uh, when the chassis are, are, are up and rolling. So having given all that information, what we want to do now is go back to the title and the, uh, the essence of the program itself is the maintenance tips and what you can do as a fleet manager and, uh, with, your, with your fleet and with your product, uh, the, your existing fleet on a going forward basis to try to weather this. You have to get through this. If the new vehicles aren't coming, the old ones have to run a little bit longer. Obviously maintenance becomes an issue and things of that nature. And that's what we want to, to bring to you today. So I'll turn it over to uh, Drew Morrow, please. Thank you very much. Mark and Mark, uh, we really appreciate all of the insight directly from, you know, the manufacturers. Uh, today, I'm joined here with Trampus Gaspard of Arcadian Ambulance and Dan Fellows from the Richmond Ambulance Authority also had a lot of input on this. You know, we're here today to share, you know, the best practices for all sizes and scopes of fleets in the association. Uh, to some of you, uh, these preventive maintenance measures may be second nature, and we all just want to make sure everybody's on the same page when it comes to uh, preventive maintenance. Um, we just want to make sure that um, the techniques and, um, you know, procedures that we use um, we share with everybody and um, make sure that the training and uh, outreach to your resources as far as dealers and other uh, services in your area are, you know, open and everybody sharing ideas. So when it comes to parts, um, you know, Mark had spoke about it and um, everything is just delayed, you know, and this parts thing started before the chips. It started a long time ago. And um, we want to make sure everybody's just watching their parts, because obviously parts is a key 
um, piece to good preventive maintenance. Um, and we wanna make sure that you build up a good supply of parts um, and recognize what your quick movers are. You know, you, you wanna look at your inventory, you wanna look and see what moves on a day-to-day -day basis and hold an adequate number of that stuff. Um, Trampus, what would you say might, might be some of the things that people want to key in on? Are we talking about filters? Are we talking about brakes? What are some of the things that you see on your end? I, I definitely key in on the filters and brakes, but obviously we don't want to start hoarding it. But if you are not tracking your inventory level currently, you are kind of behind the eight ball. Uh, you need to start tracking it now. If you don't have any program to track your inventory for, you are get it automated. You need to get some type of Excel sheet going, but brakes is a major issue right now. I'm sure most people on this call know that you're already running into a shortage of brake pads because of the, the supplies needed to build the brake pads. So filters, yes. And obviously I know you may, some departments or some companies may not like aftermarket parts. You might have to curve your thinking to be able to weather this process until we see our inventory starting to come back up. That's a conversation they're going to have to have with their their choice of vehicles. Um, it depends on your vehicle you're using. Will it void your warranties? So your managers, directors, whomever has that relationship with their supplier really needs to strike up the conversation now of what would they do to help them get through this if they have to use aftermarket parts. This is a very important time also to build stronger and stronger relationships with your network of suppliers. You should be checking in with your network of suppliers on a weekly basis, as many suppliers as you hold in your vendor list, uh, check in on what they have as far as back orders. And that just isn't on the few chassis that we've talked about. You know, ask them what they have as far as back orders, or even on passenger cars, maybe come up with tendencies. You know, maybe like Mark said, I mean, all of the raw materials have issues. So maybe there's, you know, some sort of rubber shortage. Maybe there is, again, more electronic shortage. So when you really look at this list of back orders, that helps you think outside the box to build a better cache of parts in your inventory. And um, and that, not to cut you off on that, don't just look local. If you aren't using national vendors already, um, you need to look at that. Even though you may not have a fleet in multiple states, you need to look at your national vendors who can potentially get you a better supply chain. That's for sure. Definitely. You know, you want to be reaching out to anybody and everybody you can. And again, you know, we're talking here in, you know, from Massachusetts to North Carolina, to Kansas, to Louisiana, you know, use your resources. That's what the association's about. Reach out to everybody. We'll talk more about how we're going to try to communicate better on this stuff towards the end of the presentation. Um, and when we talk about, you know, supplier network, you know, don't just go with the closest supplier down the street from your shop that gives you the best price. Reach out to suppliers all over the place. Some might not have as good of prices as others, but you really want to make sure that you're throwing each and every supplier in your area, you know, a bone. And again, you know, we talked about it. This may be the point in time where, you know, you look into aftermarket parts, you know, you want to make sure that you take you know, an apples for apples type of comparison between, you know, parts. You, you put a set of brakes on, on one truck that runs in a certain area and it must have another truck in that same area. Put an aftermarket set of brakes on that and kind of see what happens. See where, see where the, you know, um, project takes you and maybe you might find a superior part. Um, but again, like, like Trampus mentioned, and I'm sure Mark would, would love us to talk about um, OE parts. You know, I think with a lot of the, you know, fleet managers, directors that I talk with, um, original equipment is what the vehicle is tested with, you know, all of the time and energy that all of the main, major manufacturers put the vehicles through their safety testing, their longevity in their you know, temperature testing all happens with these original parts. So I can't stress enough, enough how good of luck I've had with original manufacturing parts. Not only um, will it hold up to the warranties that Ford puts out there, but also if you ever have any warranty claims, you know, we talked about it a little bit already with, um, you know, your fleet maintenance software, 
if you can provide historical data that you've done your preventive maintenance on a set schedule and with original manufacturer's equipment, there's not really too many times you can get any pushback from a dealer on, you know, standing up to a warranty. Trampus, have you ever had any issues with this, sending something in and getting any not pushback? Not at all. I mean, I'm not going to throw disclaimers for any of the dealerships. We use a mixed variety of fleet, but on what you're talking about, you need a good software. I've had some of our dealers that actually on a warranty where I was eight to 10,000 miles over it, just based on the preventive maintenance schedule we maintain on the vehicle. So it really does go a long way of having a good software to document everything you're putting into that vehicle and what type of parts you're using. So the next thing we want to talk about is again, you know, sharing parts, please, you know, let's not turn this into you know, the big COVID scare of toilet paper and sanitizer and stuff like that. Um, and I'm sure, you know, everybody's CFO will love to hear this. Let's keep the parts at the warehouses. You know, definitely, again, communicate strongly with your suppliers. Tell them what your usage levels are. Communicate that directly with them, but leave the inventory in the warehouse. Make sure you understand um, what their delivery schedules are. Don't sell yourself short on things, but you know, there's nobody needs to hold, you know, a pallet of filters or pallets of brakes or anything like that. Leave the leave the equipment out there for others so that we can all um, really perform preventive maintenance at the highest level. Um, and again, you know, speaking of CFOs and, and stuff like that, really make sure you're respecting the net terms of your deals with your vendors. You always wanna make sure that you're keeping people happy and, and making sure they're seeing the turnaround. They're giving you parts, they're expecting something in return also. Um, and again, you know, if you start holding large amounts of these parts in your inventory, you could put an excess um, strain on your neighbor's service that's right next door, which again, puts added call volume on your system. So we can't stress enough, you don't need to hoard parts. What you need to do is communicate as best you can with your suppliers, expand your supply and network, go nationally and make sure you take care of people on, on your net terms. Um, and then we move on, I guess, you know, to the biggest, uh, I think most important thing uh, as an ambulance technician, as a fleet administrator, um, preventive maintenance. You know, preventive maintenance is the most important thing to an ambulance service. Um, nobody can run without trucks. And um, really what you're here to do is make sure the trucks can stay on the road. Make sure that every single, you know, shift that is on the schedule can be filled by a truck. And the only way that you can do that is really, uh, keeping your hands on the vehicle and kind of seeing it as quickly and as often as possible. Um, Trampus, what, what, are, what are some of the service plans that you have? You know, do you do something where you're not, do, do you have a PM schedule where you're not actually changing oil or does everything start with your oil change? Is that your A service? Everything starts with our all changes at the A service. Um, I don't know. Everybody in the industry may track it differently. Some people by miles, some people by hours. We use a coalition of both at Acadian. Um, most of our manufacturers will recommend change your oil every 15,000 miles. There's no way I would run an ambulance at 15,000 miles without changing the oil. So we set our mileage interval automatically at 7,500 miles just as a redundancy for in case our system that tracks the hours does not give us the warnings that we need. So we go well, well past or before what our manufacturers recommend. Um, hours wise, we, we really don't have a set hour schedule because traditionally we're, re we're reaching that 7,500 mile mark long before the hour threshold that we use. So currently we're doing everything by miles only based on a lower threshold of what the manufacturers are recommending to us. It, to the bean counters of the companies, the CFOs, they may not like that because you're spending more money on oil, you're spending more money frequently on, on a filter, but when you compare a $300 PM to a $13,000 motor, it's not really hard to get your 
your CFO is on board of understanding why you're spending this money up front. If you're expecting to get the three, four hundred thousand miles on a motor, you can't go with just the manufacturer recommendations. You have to modify it for yourself. Yeah, that's a good point that Trampus brings up. You know, my service here at Pro that, that I am in charge of the fleet, you know, we're a lot different than that. We would reach an hour threshold long before we would reach a mileage threshold. Um, and tracking hours can be challenging on older vehicles. Um, some people install mechanical hour meters, which is something that's hooked up, you know, directly to the ignition of the vehicle. And when the ignition is turned on, it starts clocking hours. Um, we actually, you know, kind of had spoken with Mark before this um, presentation and now starting, you know, 2020 or, or a little bit before that, even heavy duty vehicles have an hour meter on the dash. So, you know, whatever way you track your oil change or preventive maintenance frequency, make sure that you stick with it. It's very consistent and it doesn't have to stay the same. You know, it can always adapt. Um, uh, it needs to adapt. You got to constantly monitor it and adapt it to the change of your, your systems. Yep. And, and this brings up our next point, something that Trampus is very, uh, uses a lot and you can get a lot of data. It's oil sampling. Um, oil sampling is something that can be done um, at your local fleet maintenance garage. It can be done by outside vendors. It's something that's promoted usually by your oil supplier. Trampus, why don't you take us through your process and some of the information that you've gotten from uh, oil sampling? Yeah, our process goes directly from our vendor. We do have 15 different locations with the cadence, so we buy our oil in bulk. So I'm able to use that with our supplier and every PM we complete in a vehicle, we do send off for an oil analysis. It has saved us product, not exaggerating over the last year, over a hundred motors that would have probably blown. Your oil analysis is critical. It will give you a early warning system. If you have something internal that should have been simple to save you an entire motor, it's not a, it's not a, large cost even if you don't buy in bulk it's, it's not a huge cost to do this compared to what it will save you um, it, it has caught so many early warning signs for us on not just our older units but one year two year old units that we shouldn't have been seeing issues with it, it's an abundance of wealth of information if you're not doing it really reach out to your vendor or if you're using outside services reach out to them and see what type of all analysis program they offer. It will save you thousands in the long run. So as Mark alluded to earlier, there are a lot of components and systems involved in an ambulance. And again, kind of like we've talked about, there's a lot of differences from one service to another. So I think the most important thing in preventive maintenance is for each and every service to develop their own preventive maintenance checklist. Whether you've done a pre uh, preventive maintenance service on an ambulance once or a hundred times, it's always good to have a checklist that is unique to your own service to refer back to, to make sure you're hitting the points. You know, Trampus has mentioned it in a conversation, you know, he couldn't share the, you know, preventive maintenance checklist with us because it would take up four or five slides. There are so many individual systems in an ambulance that you have to make sure you check each and every time. So when you take a truck off the road for preventive maintenance service, it is imperative, you know, the vehicle is up in the air, you're getting the wheels off, you know, you're checking the brakes, you, you can really see the underneath of, it, of the vehicle, you're getting your hands on things. I know stuff that we see in our area, you know, rust and rot and, you know, all kinds of issues from weather, you, you're going to miss if you don't get it up in the air and get the wheels off every single time. So it's very important to make sure that you develop a strong preventive maintenance checklist and your technicians are following it and you're reviewing the list and maybe again, adapting it. Um, preventive maintenance is never something that's going to stay set stagnant. It's going to change constantly and you need to just evolve your fleet services department around changing environment. Um, you know, and there's other things also, you know, that, you know, happen. And again, you, you know, you just adapt to them. Um, you know, we've followed plans that are recommended by the manufacturer and we've seen that, you know, you, when you, 
complete a lot of services, vehicles that don't get as much preventive maintenance as an ambulance may not have issues like ambulances are seeing. We used to, you know, remove a transmission pan, every other transmission service to change the filter on a filter that says it only needs to be replaced during overhaul. And we realized that we were stripping the bolts out of the uh, transmission case. So again, can constantly adapting your plan. Um, and another thing, you know, Trampus and our friend Dan, who's on this slide here, you know, we're all, you know, very uh, strong on is data. You got to capture data. There's a million different ways to capture the data, um, but you don't have to have elaborate fleet maintenance software systems. Um, they are, you know, there's a lot of them out there. They're very cost effective, but if you only have a few vehicles and you don't think that, you know, you really need a fleet maintenance software, you can do a lot of stuff by capturing important information and putting it on a um, Excel spreadsheet and just making sure that you can recognize tendencies of the vehicle. You can capture technician competency, uh, unit, uh, unit down hours. I mean, there's a lot of stuff with data that you can take and again, make adaptations to your preventive maintenance service. Trampus, what are maybe one of the things that you've seen through data that you've made some changes over the years? Um, it saved us. We, on a certain manufactured model, we, uh, through the data that we were tracking, we were having a, a large amount of transmission failure on a certain year model of a vehicle. It, we were able to get ahead of it just by tracking our data on, on that. That was one thing that stopped us from having vehicles left on the road. We still had to work with the manufacturer, obviously, and we were able to show that there was a trend of this particular year model with a transmission at a pretty much consistent level of mileage where they were all failing and we were able to get some assistance from the, uh, from the manufacturers on it where they actually warranted, even though it wasn't in warrant anymore. Okay, so again, you know, when you're capturing data, there are very important, um, um, uh, there's very important things that you need to capture. Number one is either mileage or hours. You have to be weekly, you know, capturing mileage and hours getting that on some type of record keeping platform. Again, whether it's a fleet maintenance software, whether it's an Excel sheet, you need to capture mileage and hours. Um, that will help you build your PM do list. And then again, you know, you can start from manufacturer's recommendations, um, which again, ambulances fall even in a higher category than severe duty. You know, when they talk about severe duty, they put it through a lot of punishment. They're not putting it through half the punishment that these uh, field providers are going through. You have to remember they're driving over curbs, they're doing anything and everything they can do to get to these calls. So you need to take that severe duty schedule and make it a little bit sooner than that and start at that as a baseline. Um, some more data that you should be capturing, you know, fuel data gallons per fill up against your mileage, cost at the pumps, and fuel cards is a great way to capture this data. Um, a couple of, you know, key performance indicators you can get from, um, you know, your fuel cards, you can start to see, okay, do I have certain trucks that are, you know, they're starting to lose miles per gallon? Is there an engine performance issue? That will start to raise red flags, and maybe you need to bring that th truck in, and you need to check that. Um, what do you capture off of fuel cards, Trampus? Uh, we, all of our mileage is captured off of that. And we do our mileage comparison to see where we're at, like you're referencing. Am I dropping miles per gallon? Am I seeing this on four or five different style vehicles? Is, is it consistent with this year model to this year model? Uh, we use that not only for bringing it in for maintenance, but for our projections of where we stay with this particular model vehicle. Is it reliable enough for us? It, we use it not just for the maintenance, but for also projection of what we're going to stay with in our fleet. Excellent. So, you know, Trampus has spoke about it a little bit, you know, as far as the service that he has, um, you know, we here have a certain um, level of expectations from our fleet services department, but also there may be services out there that, you know, use an outside vendor. Outside vendors are very important, um, not only for preventive maintenance, but like I mentioned at the end, if you have in-house fleet maintenance service, 
The fleet maintenance in-house service should be most keyed in on preventive maintenance. And then if there is an influx in repairs, you again rely on an outside vendor. Um, you need to build certain checklists and set strict expectations for outside vendors. You wanna talk with them directly when you first meet them or try to welcome them on as a vendor. And you need to let them know exactly what you're expecting. Um, it, you know, explain kind of some of the circumstances in your own shop and tell them, hey, listen, you're an extension of my abilities on my property. Again, build checklists. You wanna know, you send a vehicle there, you wanna know exactly what you get back and also, you know, do spot checks. You know, you don't have to check every single vehicle. You have to have a certain level of trust with people, but you want to do random spot checks to make sure you're getting exactly what you expect from the vendor. Because again, you don't want to have to check them all the time. You want to be able to trust that these guys are providing the same level of service you would if you were touching the vehicles. And again, you know, when you start to meet these vendors, um, go and do inspections of their facilities see what their continuing education program is for their technicians, look at their equipment. You know, you would expect the same facility at, of an outside vendor as you would of your own vendors. And I think this brings us, uh, again, here we go. There's a perfect example of Trampus's checklist. Trampus, why don't you kind of maybe explain how you use outside vendors? We use them as a, I hate to say as a last resort. We try to do all repairs. Uh, and preventive maintenance in-house if we can. If we do have to outsource, this is an abbreviated version of what is expected of our in-house preventive maintenance. We will use this if we're just so backlogged or if we're in the middle of a hurricane situation and we're trying to get caught up. Before I'll use a vendor, he or she, the owner of the company has to agree to complete this form in totality without any exceptions to it. If they can't commit to doing it, buy this checklist and they simply don't get our business. Um, they have to fill this form out upon every time they do service for us if we use them and we get it back with the vehicle. And we will take a small percentage, a 20% check of vehicles and we'll go back and double check of what they did to ensure that the work is being completed. Uh, we are paying for a service, but they're not there. The owner is a mechanic could be taking a shortcut. So we still do go back and touch any vehicles we send to outside services on a few key components, even though they've checked off everything saying it was completed. This is not every aspect we check on our in-house PM, as I said, this is just something that we put together that we felt were the key parts to be checked if we were in a bind and needed to send it to an outside service. Excellent. So as uh, administrators of, you know, fleet service departments. Again, when we were building up for this presentation, um, we really wanted to, you know, throw up the white flag. We wanted to raise our hand. Uh, in, in these times of parts shortages, vehicle shortages, vehicles that are staying on the road longer than ever, we need help. We need help from the operations team and we need it in a, a big way. Um, we really, you know, right from the get go, we need to make sure that these vehicles are getting cleaned, you know, each and every day, you know, pretty much, you know, a, a tech uh, operations person, just doing a simple wash of a vehicle is going to recognize issues, you know, you're going to recognize that something's loose, a tire is low on air, a mirror is broken, there's only a certain amount of employees in the fleet maintenance uh, services department, and there's a lot more people out in operations. So we really need a hand from operations. Um, you know, really, and another, you know, key thing is you need to appoint a supervisor with mechanical ability to extend themselves and go through and do a checklist weekly on the vehicles. We put together a form here of things that somebody with a small amount of mechanical knowledge could go through to help us figure out and recognize problems as soon as possible. And again, with the operations staff, I'm sure there's a lot of different ways to communicate back to um, support services, fleet maintenance, that there is an issue. We need to know about these issues right away. It is critical to fix problems with vehicles as soon as they happen. Whether you think it's a small issue or not, it really quickly snowballs into a big problem. So as quick as we can get reports back from the field, and, and again, on the fleet maintenance fellows, you know, I mean, 
You really need to address the issues for the providers as quick as possible and respond back to them. Let them know. You know, they may feel a vehicle is very unsafe and you look at something and find an inspection and it wasn't really a big deal, but you need to tell the crew exactly what happened. This is how I fixed it. This is what we found to give them that sense of security and a two-way street on communicating back and forth on issues. Um, and we're gonna go, that, uh, here's a, another nice uh, thing that Arcadian does. Trampus, what kind of information does the UF Fast Five provide for you? Uh, well, it gets it out to our, our mechanic. I mean, our, uh, our operational team. We don't expect them to be mechanics. We don't expect them to notice the big things, but the simple things were being overlooked for a while whenever we started bringing our vehicles for maintenance, low two, three quarts of oil, things that a, mecha a mechanic won't see on a daily basis, but our operations team see every day. So we came up with this simple little sticker. We call it the Fast Five Check. It's something that takes the, the medics one, two minutes to do a quick check for key elements. A few little slogans about unnecessary idling to help us mitigate how much idling time we have and to make it simpler for our crews to report issues. The two codes that have been blurred out they can scan that off their smartphone or their tablets provided by the ambulance or in the ambulance. And it sends a direct maintenance request, not only to the respective shop where that vehicle is assigned to, but also to the manager over that region and to myself, to where we, somebody will reply to them within a few minutes or get this vehicle in within a few hours if it's something urgent. So we try to keep operations involved in it. As you touched on it, we can't touch every vehicle our mechanics can't touch every vehicle on a daily basis. The crews are the ones touching it. And this simple little sticker is a quick reminder for them as they're getting in their unit, doing their inventory, getting ready to start their shift that, hey, I need to check my all of my depth real quick, check this to where I can, I'm ready for shift. It, it's simple little things like that where operations will have to step up even more during this time frame because the, the maintenance shops won't be able to do it in their own whenever we're pushing our vehicles maybe up to 200,000 miles more than we traditionally would run them with what's going on right now. And again, you know, we are not in the vehicles all the time. And this brings up the next topic, telematics. You know, we really, we're not the ones operating the vehicle. We're taking care of the problems. We're trying to keep the vehicles on the road. Telematics right now will be a key to keep unforeseen breakdowns to a minimum. Uh, using telematics, you can observe driver behavior. You know, you want to point out and you want to really, you know, counsel these aggressive and uh, drivers that are just not really paying attention, smashing into things. Um, you can't speed up a body shop. You know, you, you have a truck that's out of service for a week, two weeks, that's putting added strain on mostly with people's spare vehicles. And again, the spare vehicles are the ones that are, you know, over and above your mileage thres threshold that you thought you were going to get rid of this year. And now you have, you know, forced to hold on to them. So make sure we really, you know, counsel again, we, you know, you want to make sure that you approach the people that are aggressive drivers in the correct manner, but you want to let them know, Hey, you know, you can't be abusing company vehicles. You can't be, you know, driving too fast. Uh, you know, you can't be aggressively braking, you know, really try to minimize the abuse of the vehicles and that'll help prolong and take a little bit of pressure off the fleet maintenance uh, department. And just think, you know, one totaled vehicle that we would be able to usually call our local ambu ambulance manufacturer and get, you know, maybe something that was a demo vehicle or a vehicle that was off their lot. Those aren't available right now. So really drivers are a key component to this. And again, with the operations team to help us kind of get through this, take it easy, drive slow, don't cause an emergency, go into an emergency. Um, and again, here we go with the, the next topic, uh, vehicle and campus security. Uh, vehicle security is a huge ongoing issue. We see it all the time. Vehicle thefts are reported in the ambulance vocation daily. Um, there are a multitude of different ways to approach vehicle security. Um, we could, you know, get examples uh, from Trampus. We could get examples from the manufacturer. Main thing is 
make sure when your crews leave the vehicle at the hospital or on scene, it is locked behind them. One vehicle stolen and totaled isn't replaceable nowadays. So really you have to figure out what your policy and procedure is on vehicle security and make sure that you're enforcing the providers to lock the vehicles, shut the vehicles off. Um, Trampus, maybe you can explain how your vehicle security system works and maybe how your providers utilize it. Uh, we have two or three different style securities that we use depending on what make model the vehicle is. All of our vehicles we've outfitted with an aftermarket keypad, just like most of the ambulance industry, we were using mirror buttons for a long time thinking, oh, nobody knows what that button is and our medics are pushing, but it, it's not hard to figure out what that was. So our entire fleet is off an aftermarket keypad with a code that is given out to the employee once they start for that particular vehicle. Um, as far as security for not being able to start, it depends on the make and model. Our Mercedes units for years, we were able to use a system that was referred to as a scurf system, where if you didn't know what button to push, the vehicle would die out if you tried putting it in gear. That is no longer an option through Mercedes. And what our GM and Ford for that, also we're using um, a system de developed by uh, Timco. It was actually designed for law enforcement particularly. And it's a, it's a great security measure where if your crews forget to lock the door, unless you know certain features of the vehicle, you can't put it in gear. So we put a few extra redundancies in place. Uh, with our fleet, we had no choice but to do it that way because we don't allow the crews to take the keys out of our units. They're tethered to the dashboard because every company runs different. We run a very streamlined fleet where our units, some of them will run 24 hours a day and we're just doing hot shift changes and such. So we had to get very creative on our security systems being the keys are tethered to the dashboard and we we found those were the best systems but it doesn't stop it we still have issues um we, we've had a few recent incidences where our security was uh breached so you, you always have to be looking at it and evaluating it. it's it's a constantly changing scenario and they're going to figure out a way to get into it no matter what you do Again, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that I, I've talked about a few times is communication, you know, counseling the crews, talking to the crews, enforcing policies, you know, and man, I, I, the main thing that I heard from what Trampus just says is adapt and overcome. You know, if you come up with a situation where something's not working properly, adapt and overcome, you know, definitely security is an issue. Um, in the association, they talk about it a lot. Um, you know, recruitment and retention, we fall into that same bucket when it comes to technicians. Um, really, we compete, unfortunately, with guys like Mark and all their guys uh, at dealerships. Um, skills and technology is just advancing. You know, we talk about these chips. Some vehicles have, you know, 15 or 20 different computers on them. So technology is moving at a rate that's sometimes hard to keep up with. Um, again, I am a huge proponent of factory um, diagnostic equipment. Fortunately, here at Pro, we run one vehicle, uh, one manufacturer. So to have uh, factory diagnostic equipment is pretty easy because we don't run multiple chassis. Along with that factory diagnostic equipment, there is factory training involved. Reach out to your local dealers. You can get access. We can communicate here as an association to get stronger access from the manufacturers, but in the future, it's going to get, you know, tougher and tougher. Build, you know, strong relationships with your local tech schools. It's, it's all at a different level. There's vocational high schools, there's vocational programs at community colleges. There's a couple of different universities that uh, specialize in automotive and diesel technology. Um, but really, it's an ongoing thing. Whether you have a, a strong staff of four or five, you always want to be talking to people, get on um, boards with these schools and talking to kids and trying to get them interested in uh, automotive and diesel repair because it, it's a dying breed. Uh, manual labor is something that it's hard to come by for people to fill that spot. 
I guess, Mark, this is where we're putting you in the spotlight again. How, how are you guys dealing with kind of attracting people to be technicians in 2021? Yeah, we're doing exactly the same things you're talking about. We're, we're uh, very involved with our local school uh, district here as far as our automotive training program. We also have an extremely strong program down in Pittsburgh, Kansas, that's nationwide, um, that uh, feeds a lot of the OEMs, their, their technicians. So we're very involved down there. We sponsor some events uh, that, that we, they do at each one of these schools. Uh, we actually have them in here tour have tours here for our facility we have a quick lane facility for oil changes so we also offer an apprenticeship program through there where we get them in just to learn teach them how to change oil work there for a while and then we offer them a tool program if they'll go and go on and start working and get certified you have to be certified to work on a ford vehicle at a ford dealership if you do get certified we'll help them with a with their own set of tools or or a partial set of tools i should say to get them uh, kind of started in that direction but it's, a, it's, it's ongoing all the time. And Ford, just so you know, has regional people that each region can speak out to, to uh, talk to also. Ford's very involved with this again. We have a military training program as well at Ford. Uh, so yeah, we're, they're uh, tapping into all uh, available opportunities there as well. That's awesome. You know, we're really putting more and more strain and more and more responsibility on these technicians. Appreciate the technicians, you know, and it starts right with, you know, the good old attaboy, you know, make sure people know that they're doing a good job. Make sure that, you know, you're recognizing people when they go over and above. Recognize that people do have a life outside of work. You know, hours become long. People, you know, really like the paycheck. So they're going to try to put in as many hours as possible. You know what, you have a slow day where there's not a lot of trucks that are down or something like that. Maybe you cut a couple of guys loose so that they can go home and go fishing with their kids or enjoy a, a family dinner that gets skipped or, or something like that. So again, really appreciate and recognize your staff for the amount of responsibility that they have to keep the riders safe and, and to keep the trucks out there on the road doing calls. And that wraps it up for the preventive maintenance portion. I think we're going to turn it over to Maria and see what kind of information she has. Thank you all so very much. And um, we are kind of running out of time. So I want to make sure we have a few Q&As um, that are in the queue. So I'm just going to quickly go over what we're doing at the federal and what we're recommending people do at the state level with regard to lobbying and working with the regulators and the legislators. So you may not be aware, but on February 24th, President Biden did sign an executive order basically doing a 100-day review on a number of key elements that Mark Van Arnhem mentioned that were in uh, low supply, one of which is obviously the microchips. Um, and is definitely putting money towards moving that up the food chain and making sure that they are giving enough funding at the federal level to uh, increase the microchip production. And so uh, that report should come back very relatively soon. And then um, I would venture to guess that we, they will do everything they can, um, just like they did during the pandemic with PPE to make sure that they can ramp up production. Not that that's gonna solve it overnight. The AAA is meeting with key leaders um, legislatively. So for example, we have a meeting next week, Mark Van Arnhem will be joining us with Senator Debbie Stabenow from Michigan, obviously with the major big three manufacturers um, of uh, cars there. Um, we are gonna be talking with them um, and putting a little pressure on them to see what they can do with some of the manufacturing um, divisions that are shut down, waiting for the chips. And we'll continue to put pressure on legislators at the federal level to see if they can help us. The other thing that we're doing at the federal level is we're engaging with CISA, which is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Administration out of the Department of Homeland Security. They're the ones, in case you don't recognize the name, who developed the system by which um, providers and individuals were identified as who is at the top to get, receive the vaccine, for example. Well, they also are very good when there are shortages in um, supply chain in identifying those service sectors that really need to be put at the top of the queue. 
And I would argue as the CEO of the American Ambulance Association that ambulances should be put at the top of the queue when microchips become available. So the AAA will be working diligently to get CISA to identify us as a top priority so that when chips become available, um, they are given to the manufacturers of our chassis so that we can get our chassis built sooner rather than later. At the state level, we're really paying attention mostly at the municipality level, but we're asking our ambulance services to pay attention to either contracts that they have, um, municipal requirements that may be in place as it relates to really two major areas. And that is mileage. If there's any restrictions on the number of miles a truck can have on its unit that you may wanna request from that municipality or in that contract a waiver um, for a, you know, a, a, a finite amount of time until manufacturing can get ramped up that would waive that requirement that vehicles be taken off um, after 100,000 miles or whatever that criteria may be, as well as age being another uh, identifier that could be in either your contracts or part of your uh, municipality's requirements or rules. And if you can work with those regulators um, and those municipalities at the local level and mitigate some of those things, it could keep some of your older units safe and on the streets so that perhaps you don't need as many new units as quickly as you might otherwise. And just another way that you can manage your fleet. Um, if you have any other ideas or suggestions, um, if you're a member of the American Ambulance Association, we're here to help. So if there's anything that we can do to assist you with your efforts on the state or local level, please get in touch with us. We've already met with the National Association of State EMS officials so that we're working with them to help you mitigate things on the state level. And um, that's all I had to share with you. And then we'll just turn it over to any questions that we may have left to answer for the program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, we are a little bit over, but we do have four relatively quick questions that folks have been waiting to hear the answers to. Um, Drew and Trampus, can you suggest some of the fleet management software that works well for you and EMS providers? Drew, I know what you're using. Uh, we use Dossier. It's a excellent program. It puts in, you can set it up correctly to where you can automatically have your, your mileage imported into it off of your fuel sites and you set up the intervals you want and it will send you out automatic uh, updates of what's coming due. You don't have to track it manually. It's, it, it gives you a wealth of information and if you use it correctly, you can actually forecast on mileage projections and when you're gonna need to replace your vehicle within a five year period. So the one we're currently using is called RTA, which again, it's as robust as the amount of data that you want to put into it. RTA is used nationally. It's a great service, it takes APIs from a bunch of different resources, fuel cards, telematics, all that type of stuff. Um, the kind of cool thing about RTA is that you can send work orders directly to a technician via a tablet. So you don't need to necessarily be right in front of the technician. You can send them their next job to kind of keep things rolling. Uh, they have a dashboard feature where you could almost put up a monitor in the, in the garage and you could kind of give people live updates of what's going on in uh, your fleet. And there's another one that I've heard great things about. It's called Fleet IO. Um, at the last service we were at, we used another one called Fleet Maintenance Pro. So there's really a lot of them out there. And again, we're here to share information. So if people need uh, fleet maintenance software or they want it, this is another great thing to get on to base camp and we can all kind of talk about the pros and cons of each and every system. I actually have a spreadsheet that somebody shared with us to do a Q&A with um, uh, fleet maintenance software companies so that you could get exactly what you wanted. So I can share that with anybody that wants it also. Thank you so much. I think that that resource will be available only through base camp. So if you want to, uh, connect directly with Drew Trampas and our other fleet management experts, please email hello at ambulance.org to request to join our membership group. Um, just in the interest of time, we'll move two of the remaining questions to Basecamp and answer them there. But let's wrap up with considering fleet talent, 
how important is it if you use outside fleet service providers that they have EVT and or ASE certifications? So being a master certified ASE and EVT um, technician, so we'll go back and that's automotive science engineering and emergency vehicle technician. Um, it, I think it's more a measuring stick. Uh, really, you know, it's great for, um, you know, continuing education. It's great to make sure that people know what, um, you know, all the standards are, what you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. But is it something that you have to have as an outside service? I would say no. I've worked with a lot of great technicians that aren't certified, um, but you know, especially if you don't know somebody and you're looking to set up a new relationship, I would say it's very important. Trampus, how do you feel about ASE and EVT? I fully agree with you on it. I mean, uh, I don't want to say I don't put a lot of weight in it. Um, you can be a phenomenal mechanic without having a certification. It's just personal preference from some of the mechanics who want to get the certification and move on and maybe move into a dealership environment or something uh, for a better paying career, but it, it doesn't make the mechanic. I, I don't put a lot of weight into it. Thank you both. And thank you to Mark Van Arnhem and Mark McEver for joining us as well, as well as American Ambulance Association CEO, Maria Bianchi for providing the advocacy update. Um, once again, we encourage you to email hello at ambulance.org to be added to our fleet management base camp. And then please do join us on July 7th for a, our next webinar, uh, flipping off the switch on hot emergency vehicle responses. That is again, free to um, all members of the EMS community. So we look forward to seeing you again soon on another American Ambulance Association webinar. Thanks so much and have a great afternoon. Thank you all. Thanks, Amanda.